Hi, uh, this is Charlie Vaughn and Greg Simsick in the uh, studio today. Welcome to the Occupy Reco Ukiah Report for May 16th, 2012. And uh, the reason that we're uh, in the sound booth today, in the video booth, here's our gear that we use to, to produce the show, is that today all we're going to show is some video clips of the uh, Occupy Mendocino Fair, street fair, that uh, we went to. <coughs> Uh, Occupy Ukiah went to the street fair and took part um, last Saturday, May 12th, and um, we put up our canopy, and they closed off the entire block uh, of Laurel Street from uh, commercial uh, on down, or from uh, Main Street, I believe, for a block. It was really a great fair. There was, like, nonprofit uh, vendors there. There were speakers. There was music. There was... Um, some political candidates. Um, it was it was pretty cool. It went from uh, noon to five, and we had a good time. And Greg shot a whole lot of uh, video footage of all the uh, uh, pieces of all the events. We couldn't get it all because it was a five-hour event. So uh, what we're going to see today is some clips from that. You're going to see some music. You're going to see some speakers. You'll see some candidates. I think we have an interview of Norm Solomon, who's running for Congress, and. Um, and uh, now that we're talking about that, uh, we want to say that Occupy Ukiah does not endorse any political candidate, even though you may see them speaking on here. They are speaking for themselves. Any of the speakers or opinions that you may see uh, presented in this video um, are not necessarily the opinions of Occupy Ukiah. They are solely the opinions or words of the speaker that you see. So anyway, uh, we got about an hour-long show today, and I think that's about all we have to say. Uh, we're, uh, this is all you're going to see for the show today of us, and we should be coming back maybe next week or maybe the week after um, with um, our usual format. So uh, enjoy the show, and we'll be seeing you around soon. Adios. Good. Well, I hope I can uh, keep you as well entertained as Gene. That's Gene Parsons, I guess everybody knows, one of our wonderful coast musicians. So my name is Rick Childs, and I'm one of the many people here in Occupy Mendocino that have been working since January to make this uh, very big street fair happen. So uh, if you'd like, if you're walking by, come on, grab a seat. We have a wonderful afternoon of music, uh, goodies, musicians, and mainly speakers. Um, the reason we're doing this, as you probably know, where did, why are we here and what are we trying to accomplish is something that a lot of people have asked. What is Occupy all about? Many of you probably know that it started last September when a group of people went and took over a park in um, right near Wall Street in New York, and it became Occupy Wall Street. And that incubus has now spread throughout the country and actually around the world. These people um, realized that it was time to start taking action. That for the last 30 years, some basic things have started going wrong with the country. And what was going wrong had been accelerating. And in fact, the tipping point had finally been reached. And so they decided it's time to call attention to this and to start a movement to change the economic injustice that has been happening uh, throughout the country. They decided that there's several points that, that I'll talk about in a minute, but the economic injustice is wrong and that it must be changed. A lot of people wonder what exactly, when you say economic justice and what Occupy is all about, what are, what are, we, what are our goals and what are our objectives? A lot of people, because, partly because the Occupy movement is so diverse, it's kind of nebulous and people just have a sort of a feel that there's something wrong without being able to identify exactly what is it that Occupy is trying to draw attention to and what are we trying to actually fix. 
and you'll probably get a hundred different answers from a hundred different people. But my understanding of what Occupy is all about is that there's two central focal points that Occupy is trying to draw attention to and to change. The first is the growing income inequality in the United States. This is a, uh, this is a graph that shows what the top 1%, this is the 1% is in the red line, this is how their income has changed since 1979. The green line, the one below it, is how the top 10% has grown. And as you can see, everybody else, the 99%, which is all of us, we're down at the bottom and the line is basically flat. All of the economic benefits that have occurred over the last 30 years have gone to the top 10%, and most of that has gone to the top 1%. And so that is the primary thing that Occupy is trying to bring about uh, awareness of and create change in. You all know, for, in for instance, that Mitt Romney has $250 million, some of which he inherited and some of which he earned in venture capitalism. What is $250 million? What that means is that he, his wealth can earn $55,000 a day at, in just interest alone. He, can earn 50, he earns $55,000 every day from just earning interest on his accumulated wealth. And that's nothing. There's people that are in the 1% that are even wealthier than him. In 2010, one CEO of a hedge fund in New York earned $500 million in one year and paid almost nothing in taxes. $500 million. What's $500 million? The average American family makes approximately $50,000 a year. It would take them 10,000 years, 10,000 years to equal what he earned in one year. That's what Occupy is trying to draw attention to. So that's the first issue, primary issue that Occupy wants to correct. The second issue that Occupy is trying to correct is the power and the influence of that money in those few hands. Our democracy has been corrupted by big money being spent, a lot of people call it legal, legalized bribery. When they dump money, corporations and the super wealthy dump money into Washington to get special favors, lower tax rates, as you know, Romney pays less taxes than you do, lower taxes, regulation and deregulation that favor who they are. So it's the, it's the two things that Occupy is trying to bring attention to are the growing income inequality and the power of huge money in very few hands messing up American democracy and the social fabric. All of us in the 99% are being hurt by these two fundamental principles. We are being hurt by these two fundamental Occupy principles. So I'd like to take just a minute and share with you some of the spill out of these two issues. Some of, the some of the things that have come out of the Occupy attention is Wall Street. Wall Street's games and greed, the money being dumped into Washington to get deregulation, which has enabled those very few brilliant sharks to capitalize on a complex situation that has been deregulated and is not being supervised by the federal government. And they have made billions and millions of dollars while the rest of us have suffered. How? The housing crisis, the financial collapse, and the Great Recession, all principally due to what Wall Street created back in the 90s and the early 2000s. The second thing is that the conservative Republican Party has gone on a crusade to further ex exaggerate this in two ways, with two fundamental principles that we believe are fundamentally wrong. One is that taxes are evil, 
and that all government is bad and must be downsized and reduced as much as possible. Those of us disagree with that. The government is who we are. Government of the people, by the people, and for the people is being destroyed by the conservative Republicans that are out to destroy that, and therefore the social fabric of the United States. Another part of this is the fact that with dereg deregulation, banks were enabled, were allowed to merge and combine, get into speculative things, take over insurances, all those other things, and have become another problem which is called too big to fail. A fourth component of this is the Supreme Court decision two years ago called Citizens United that freed every corporation and wealthy person to dump whatever the money they want anonymously in to any campaign, any election that they want. So it's not only big money going in to buy special favors and lower taxes and deregulation in Washington, they can now get whoever they want elected by dumping as much money as they want into very sleazy advertising designed to destroy people who are standing for the other side, the liberal point of view of good government and good stewardship. As you probably know, the Koch brothers have $30 billion and they have publicly said that they will spend whatever it takes to defeat Obama in this election. This election will probably cost one and a half billion dollars. They can take one billion of their 30 billion and still have 29 billion left to defeat Obama and defeat the senators that we're supporting all around the country and put in people that will continue to, pro to, to help them out with their, their right wing agenda of, of, of more corporatized America and the plutocracy. And by the way, just to let you know, people don't know how big is $30 billion? It's so huge. It is so huge. $30 billion is what McDonald's worldwide took in last year. The amount of money going into the cash register in every McDonald's, in every McDonald's restaurant amounted to $30 billion. That's how much money the Koch brothers have. It's unbelievable. And as you know, they can spend whatever they want and have been spending whatever they wanted to put in their, their lackeys. They just destroyed a, a moderate Republican in Indiana yesterday, uh, two days ago. Luger was defeated by another Tea Party corporate um, senator candidate. The last thing I want to say that had Occupy is all about is ending of polarized politics that in the last, thir especially in the last 10 years, politics has become increasingly polarized and antagonistic, mainly because, mainly because the 1% and the right-wing Republicans have kept shifting over. The, the person that just defeated um, Luger, as you may have heard, when he was talking about bipartisanship and compromise, he said, yes, I'm all for compromise. All that has to happen is the Democrats have to become Republicans. That was his statement on Wednesday. So we have a wonderful afternoon for you all here this afternoon. We have a great roster of speakers. We have five people who are running for Congress. We have musicians in between, and we have a lot of people who will be talking about different aspects of what the Occupy agenda is all about. So thank you all very much for coming this afternoon. Stay seated and enjoy a wonderful afternoon. So, our next speaker, Charlie, you want to come up and join us? Our next speaker, as you probably know, Occupy started out in Wall Street, and there are hundreds and maybe even thousands of Occupy, local Occupy organizations that have sprung up like mushrooms after a rain ever since because the message that we have is so universal and so important. We here on, in Occupy Mendocino are not the only ones we have, a, we have a sister Occupy organization over in Ukiah. And so they have come over here, as you can see, their tents down there. They'd love for you to visit when you get a chance. 
And one of their one of their leaders is Charlie Vaughn. Charlie is a grandfather of two and a member, as I said, of Occupy Ukiah. He grew up in Seattle and as a young teen participated in the anti-war and civil rights movements back in the 60s. In the 70s, he moved to an international community in Southern Oregon and practiced consensus decision making for eight years. While living there, he became an activist to prevent the aerial spraying of herbicides in the forest. He also became active in the nuclear freeze movement during the Reagan nuclear arms escalation time. He now lives on a small farm in Redwood Valley where he's a landscaper and musician. He's been writing social political songs for over 30 years and he completed a CD of his own songs called What You Say. He now feels it's time to walk the talk with action through the Occupy movement and he's very involved in that and he's come over with some additional Occupy thoughts. Come on up, Charlie. Hi, everybody. I got my little timer right here. Uh, my name is Charlie Vaughn. I'm from Occupy Ukiah. Um, I heard the question a few times today, and that is, why do we occupy? We occupy because these are the best of times, and these are the worst of times. We've all heard that before. Well, it's true. We're here to celebrate. We're also here to, mo to mobilize. We have got a lot of work to do. This isn't going to happen overnight. Occupy means to inhabit. We are here to reclaim our habitat. It's gotten pretty messed up, as we know. On top of that, we have to accept as a society, all of us, that we have allowed things to get to this point. We can't blame it on anyone anymore. We can't whine about it. We've got to do something about it, and that's why we're here. That's why we are occupying. If we take any aspect of our lives today, food, housing, business, education, employment, transportation, health care, military, energy, human relations. These are all Occupy issues. We cannot choose just one. We have to work to each of our individual strengths, find out what we do, plug in and work at it. All of these issues and more, you could probably come up with 20 more, are things that create our organic environment. They all have to be reconnected so that they work. It's not working right now, we all know. So in our, we, that's why we are here. That's why we are occupying. Everything has to be transformed. It's a huge job. And so we're doing it through new ways. We all have varied views, just like we heard many, many times. You ask any 10 occupiers what the issues are, you'll get 20 answers. That's just how it is. We have to accept that. It's maddening at times. And it's also the beauty and the strength of the diversity of Occupy. We use things like consensus to make our decisions. And consensus is also the way that we interact with each other. We are using the media. We're using music, art, drama. We're using political action. Speaking of media, our Occupy group has a radio show on KMAC. It's on every Wednesday at 5 o'clock. Tom Ray is your host. Also, we have a TV show, and we are on Channel 3 Comcast. It's also, we're starting to send them here to the Comcast station. But you can also watch the TV show on our website at OccupyUkiah.net. The only reason I bring that up is every single cable provider is required by law to offer that station to the public. You have to pay a small fee for the use of the studio for a year. 
but it's basically free. You get trained how to use the equipment. That camera right there with Greg Simsick is part of our Channel 3 uh, production. And we're going to take that back and it'll be up on our website with some nice shots from today. Every Occupy group can have a TV show. You can post that stuff to your website. We need to use the media. So, let me move on. One of my favorite guys who just uh, passed away about two years ago is Howard Zinn. We all know who he is. He's a great leader. Howard Zinn uh, was quoted in, in uh, 2010, just, just uh, before he died, um, talking about Barack Obama. And um, I imagine most of us voted for him. I know I did. And the quote from Howard is, I think people are dazzled by Obama's rhetoric and that people ought to begin to understand that ba Obama is going to be a mediocre president. Which means, in our times, a dangerous president. Unless there is some national movement to push him in a better direction. We are that movement. That's us. That's Occupy. The people lead, the leaders follow. Don't hold these people up like royalty. We see a politician, we see somebody elected to office and, oh, sir, come right this way, here's your limo, here's your red carpet. These people are our public servants. As an Occupy member, I am a public servant. I am not a leader. I do not speak on behalf of Occupy Ikaya. I speak as myself, as a member of Occupy Ikaya. We are the movement that's going to push things in a better direction. Barack Obama cannot do it by himself. He was quoted as saying, make me do it. Let's make him do what we want. There's 99% of us. They cannot turn us away. We are still a blunt instrument. We are not finely tuned yet. We just got started. We've got to blend the old with the new. I see a lot of gray hair in our movement and I see a lot of youth. We've got to put the two together. These problems will not be resolved with an American spring. They will not be resolved in the year of Occupy. This is a way of life that we have to, sh to teach to our grandchildren. Vigilance and action. We have to pass this on through the generations. We cannot allow things to de degenerate again the way we have. Now I want to come to uh, uh, an issue that I feel is an issue that given one major event can render all of our issues moot and that is the nuclear power issue today. The tragedy at Fukushima is the moment for us to seize. We cannot ignore it. There was a, a, a fine nuclear uh, physicist who I watched a video on, and he was one of the people speaking. Top school, top of the field. He was one of the physicists and engineers that, that built and ran one of the Fukushima power plants. He said, I always thought nuclear power was safe. After the tsunami, I realized this plant is not safe. The nuclear energy, the nuclear waste today is going to be hot for thousands and thousands of, year, of years. Excuse me. If we think that Jesus lived a long time ago, if they had nuclear power plants in Jerusalem in Jesus' time, that stuff would still be as hot and deadly today as it was then. And it will still be as hot and deadly today as it is today in 50,000 years. Some of those things are deadly for a million years. Can we imagine how we manage that stuff? We can barely, we can barely manage our chemical pollution for 10 years. One earthquake on this coast or anywhere in this country 
can poison our water, our soil, our food, and our genetics for generations to come and cause it so that we cannot fight our Occupy issues. We will be scrambling for survival. We must not let this moment pass. We have to address the issue. We are very calm and, and collected and we allow the, the scientists to run that and they do not know what they are doing. I'm sorry. They have said that the nuclear power plants are going to withstand an 8.2 earthquake. The earthquake in Fukushima was 8.9. We cannot predict what Mother Nature is going to do. Thank you. I'm going to speak a little longer because I'm not planning on taking questions today. If you'd like to uh, talk further, I'll be down at the Occupy booth or I'll be around. You'll see me. We need to bring our military home. I think we all agree. Our military is very good. Our military is very good at mobilizing and building and, and completing missions. The amount of money that we have spent on war, we could take one third of that, bring the military home and put them to work at the energy war, at building a clean energy society. We need to shut down the nuclear power plants. We need to get off of foreign oil that we've been fighting these wars for. We could have our army and our civilians putting solar up all across the country. We need to make some sacrifices and spend our money to do that sort of thing. In order to shut down nuclear power plants, of which there's about 104 in this country, we got to start now. We have to start now. There's going to be huge resistance. This issue covers environment, government, mega corporate welfare, military, energy, banks, insurance. A nuclear power plant will not be insured. They cannot insure it. There is no insurance company in the world that will underwrite a nuclear power plant. They love to underwrite big dangerous things because they get wonderful premiums. They make tons of money. They won't touch it because they know if there's an accident, they can't pay for it. Nobody can pay for it. You know who pays for it? All of us. We pay for it. We have to be responsible for cleaning up and rebuilding and somehow dealing with the genetic damage over generations. It is not possible. We need to move forward now. This needs to be one of the Occupy issues. I really invite you to join me. This is going to be uh, my working group at Occupy. I'm involved in lots of things with them. Uh, Occupy is starting to take over my life. <laughs> uh, it's, it's starting to uh, fray my family relations. Um, it's not easy. We all know the feeling. So. I think in closing, um, there's a lot we could say, there's a lot we could talk about. I want to close with Howard Zinn, once again. And one of my favorite quotes from Howard Zinn is, we don't have to engage in grand heroic actions to participate in the process of change. Small acts, when multiplied by millions of people, can transform the world. Thank you very much. We have a wonderful partner, don't we, over in Ukiah? Yeah, really. Thank Will what will become of the working man with honest sweat on his brow? Is a nation that raised him to build it gonna turn his back on him now gonna take away his pride and his dignity give his job to some foreign land here's a question that needs a straight answer what will become of the hard working man In better times in old America, we 
sang the working man's blues with such pride. Many who work 40 hours week after week have been let go, pushed off to the side. And I'll tell you there's nothing that's sadder than a soul of a hard-working man. Nothing to do with his hands. What will become of the working girl with honest sweat on her brow? There's a nation that raised her to build it. will become a hard-working girl. What will become of the hard-working man? What will become of the hard-working <laughs> Folks, folks, folks. Parks 
the clinics open, let the teachers run the class, the children will learn much more. Corporations are the people, they'll put your church right up its steeple. Corporations are the people, so give our country Hi, we're at the Occupy Mendocino Street Fair. We're here with Norm Solomon. We've been hearing a lot of speakers and good music and all kinds of events. Uh, uh, are you going to be speaking today, Norm? I am. Looking forward to it. What time are you talking? Uh, today it's about two o'clock. About two o'clock. And uh, what's what's going to be like the main topic? What are you talking about? Well, for me, it's about democracy. All the things that we're concerned about. I mean, you were giving a very good talk that included addressing nuclear power. The whole range of environmental concerns, which go really deep and wide. People are very heartfelt about. Let's make sure there's no offshore oil drilling. Let's shut down the nuclear power plants. Let's get rid of so many toxic pesticides. Let's help the organic small farmers. Those sort of issues are part of the larger. We need democracy. And it's, unless we're willing to challenge the inordinate huge power of Wall Street, we can't go deep green. We can't have the democracy that we deserve. You know, I'm wondering, uh, we've got this whole uh, health care issue coming up. Um, we're not quite sure which way it's going to go yet. We kind of have a feeling. What do you think you can do if you get in there? Um, it looks like the people's option sort of, uh, the public option sort of went down the tubes. What, what hope do we have of having any kind of a realistic health care that will cover everybody? Well, we need a change of priorities. You know, I've been able to visit here the uh, hospital base in, in Fort Bragg. I visited coastal uh, health clinics here. Uh, looked at the way in which these community health centers are struggling for basic funding. I'm a strong supporter of Medicare for all, enhanced Medicare for everybody, uh, what's also called single payer guaranteed health care. And I think that's the solution because health care is a human right. Let's face it, the insurance, pharmaceutical, hospital, mega corporate industries are making out like bandits, posting huge profits while we have tens and tens of millions of Americans who are underinsured and tens of millions more who are uninsured. Uh, so under an uninsured means you're not getting the health care you deserve, and it's a human right. So uh, rather than uh, bolstering Wall Street profits, I believe we can have an equitable health care system. Medicare points the way, uh, but we need to get Medicare Part D so corporations aren't dominating and gouging with prices. Let's get everybody covered. We're seeing children here at this wonderful really, fair. Really. We're seeing elderly people. Everybody has a right to health care. Let's cut the military budget, have progressive taxation, calling for tax on Wall Street. People can get more info on our website, SolomonForCongress.com. But you know, right now, people are voting, and when they're voting for me, and they're seeing that Norman Solomon check the box, uh, that's about a progressive solution towards health care and making the changes that are about human rights, really. Well, it seems as if the public supported the idea of the, uh, the public option, and it got shot down so quickly. What, what, how do you think that we can make that connection with the majority and get that actually to, to, to happen? Well, there is the status quo, which is, uh, like we're saying, is unacceptable. Then there's the ideal, which I think we need to work for long-term, enhanced Medicare for everybody. And then sort of in between was this proposal for a public option where the government would offer as an alternative to commercial uh, health insurance uh, a sort of uh, government, uh, uh, under the government wing option for how people could uh, buy health insurance. It could have uh, provided a better alternative for people who now have to choose, you know, HealthNet, uh, Anthem, Blue Cross, you know, insurance companies basically, that are yeah. ripping people off. Yeah. And the business of these insurance companies is not to provide care, it's to deny care. Right. So public right. option was a step in that direction. And you know, your question is very good. What the hell happened? Well, it was shunted to the side by the power of the pharmaceutical and insurance industries. I think at the very least, that should get back on the table and eyes on the prize. we got to take care of everybody in this country in terms of health. We do, we do. Well, I think that ought to do it for today. It's Thank great you. talking to you, Norm. Thank you, Good Charlie. luck with your election. Appreciate it. And anybody's welcome to learn more at www.solomonforcongress.com. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thanks, everybody. All righty. Stay down in Duke.
Scotty Park. There are no neutrals there. We appreciate your being here, appreciate your support. And I now want to introduce, um, I want to bring Jim Tarbell back because Jim is, Jim is going to bring on a special introduction with Norman Solomon. So welcome Jim and Norman. Thank you, Sid, and thank you all for coming. I want you to know we have an opportunity now to take the Occupy movement into the halls of Congress. And we can do that by electing Norman Solomon. Norman has been a fan of Occupy since it very began. He's, he's been involved in Occupy movements in eight different cities in this vast district where he's running from the Golden Gate Bridge to the Oregon border. He's running to challenge corporate power. He's running to make sure that the 1% are not running our country. He's running to make sure that our national policies reflect the needs of the 99% and the well-being of the people. And he's ready to take that fight into the halls of Congress. He's here today to tell us about his campaign. So let's please welcome Norman Solomon to the Occupy Street Fair. Well, um, wouldn't you say it's time to occupy this open seat for the 99% in the halls of Congress? We need to be occupying in the streets, and we've got to be occupying in the halls of Congress where these decisions are being made. And as Jim mentioned, uh, I was an Occupy candidate before there was a uppercase Occupy movement, because 18 months ago when we launched, I said that this is a campaign for democracy to challenge the inordinate power of Wall Street. And isn't that true that we've got to stop Wall Street running our economy, right? When we go up and down the district and we talk with people, we're concerned with health care, education, housing, good green jobs, transportation. We are concerned that Wall Street is dominating Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington. And we're very concerned that Main Street is suffering while Wall Street is making out like a bunch of bandits. That is unacceptable. And when we look at this travesty called corporate personhood, it is a myth. You can't put a corporation behind bars. You can't accept the idea that corporations have all of the rights of human beings, but none of the accountability. And unless and until we can end the myth of corporate personhood, then we're not going to be able to have the democracy that our country deserves and needs so badly. Let's organize for democracy. Yeah. And that's really, that's really what Occupy is about. And that's why Move to Amend is so important and why I'm so proud to stand with Move to Amend, because that is our future to bring about a government of, by, and for the people, not of, by, and for the corporations. Corporations don't rule. They must not be allowed to rule. It's people who have to rule, and that's what the Occupy movement is about. And so as we do our work in the streets, as we get the move to amend agenda put on ballots, as we challenge the kind of power structure that has Monsanto running the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and as we organize to make sure that there be GMO labeling, we've got to do this kind of organizing and say that it's always inside, outside. And so I do have an appeal to you. It's possible that those of us on this block could determine the results of our next member of Congress in this district. No pressure. <laughs> but really, it could be up to us in this one block. Everybody here knows a lot of folks. Maybe you've already voted. Maybe you're about to vote. But you know dozens and dozens of people. Each one of you knows a lot of folks. And if you can talk to them about the Norman Solomon for Congress campaign, if you can explain to them, convey to them why and how we want to occupy this seat in Congress for the 99 percent, 
You can make the difference, and I'm asking you to make the difference. And you know, we're organizers. We know how to get things done. You talk to neighbors, you talk to friends, you talk to people who aren't friends, you go on Facebook, you go on Twitter, you visit our site, which is SolomonForCongress.com, and there's all sorts of stuff up there that you can share with other people. And let me be more specific, there's a table right over there which has yard signs, it has literature, it has sign-ups, because we need phone banking, we need all that stuff to get the job done. And you can talk with Steve Antler and Jim Tarbell and others over at the table right over there, and there's a big sign, I see Steve holding it right now, and bumper sticker, there he is, waving it. Thank you, Steve, and thanks to everybody who on the coast here has really enlivened our campaign. And let me close on that note, and I think we're allowing some time for, for some questions. Uh, I went on my first picket line when I was 14 years old. And it was for protesting an all-white apartment complex. This was 1966. Those who are ahead of their time are going to take the brick bats, take the harassment, be trashed in the media. In 1966, the civil rights movement for open housing was ahead of its time. In 2012, the Occupy movement is ahead of its time. That's how we get pro progress. That's how we have achieved everything that our country can be proud of. Going back to Social Security, unemployment compensation, the right to organize, gay rights, women's rights, civil rights, environmental protection, stopping wars, all of that happens because we organize. It's up to us. We've done it. We can do it. We can make ourselves proud of this country, and let's do it together. So with that, I think if anybody has any questions, we have a couple minutes, I think. Yes? <clears throat> Congressman Thompson is proposing that uh, we use military drones for uh, monitoring our national forests. And I'm asking you, do you think it's appropriate that we use military drones to monitor our national forests? Uh, the question has to do, is it appropriate to use military drones to patrol our national forests? First, I'm opposed to the use of drones overseas that have been, unfortunately, causing a lot of civilian deaths. I've been to Afghanistan, I've been to Iraq. We should be bringing food and medicine and health care. We shouldn't be bringing drones. I'm totally opposed to that military use. In this country, I want to be very clear. I support adult legalization of marijuana. And I want to be clear that I oppose the Walmartization of marijuana. I want to be clear that I support the small growers. And I oppose those huge corporate Wall Street forces that want to get in on the action. So let me be clear in context. I am very opposed to growing marijuana in county, state, and federal parks. It is environmentally damaging. It is bad for public safety. We can't allow people running around with guns when families are going into the parks. So call me hardline on that score. We've got to end prohibition. The prohibition is damaging our society day in and day out. I support the Bill of Rights. I support habeas corpus, and we have a right to be secure, as the Constitution says, in terms of our persons, in terms of surveillance and siege and surger. Well, how do you say that? Siege and surger. <laughs> However you're going to put that across. So search and seizure, whatever. Whatever is done with technology, including over the national parks, has to respect the Bill of Rights. And that's the context that we're going to talk about any use of technology. We have to make sure, and that includes use of any surveillance vehicles, whether it's people who are uh, being surveilled for their speed, speed on 101, or whether it's what they're doing in the parks, it has to be strictly respecting people's civil liberties. And that's something I don't want to compromise on. So let's have public hearings, and let's make sure that we can use, yes, use technology, and use our power to make sure that the national and state and county parks are kept free of dangers, such as guns and so forth, but let's do it in a way that really supports civil liberties. So are you against drones or for them? 
I think that we've got to look at how we can protect those lands without infringing on anybody's civil liberties. And I'm not smart enough to know exactly how to do that, but I'll tell you something. We should have hearings all up and down the district to find out exactly how we can safeguard those parks and protect civil liberties across the board. The people have to decide. Yes? You know, you don't protect the forest against the loggers or the miners. So your reasoning about the safety of the forest is like, we, we don't accept it because the forests have been torn apart by the same interests who are uptight about the Mexican people or the poor people going into the forest and surviving economically by growing new crops. I'd rather have them survive economically. And you're not going to sponsor any bills, are you, to restore the forest, to bring the forest back? You're talking about the fisheries. You know that every salmon caught out there comes from a hatchery? They don't come from the creeks anymore. Does everybody know that? All the creeks are silted in from commercial logging. There's never any complaints about the diesel spills in the forest and the destroyed habitat. But when it comes to marijuana growing, marijuana growing can't take place. Let me briefly respond. Uh, by the way, uh, I've been endorsed by Forest Forever and by Dan Hamburg, and I certainly uh, believe that the uh, huge corporations that have been ravaging the forest shouldn't be allowed to do so. Okay? Uh, I believe that public lands should, so public lands should not be subjected to these huge efforts or any efforts to grow marijuana. I believe that we've got to end prohibition, and if we end prohibition, then we can lessen the pressure on the public lands. But I'll tell you, if there's a family going out to a national park, they shouldn't have to worry that there are guys running around with guns. Also, all, also, at the same time, the environment has to be protected as well. So I'm not in favor of drones being used, but that isn't enough to say, OK, then we'll let anything go on in these parks. I want to protect the environment. I want to protect people's public safety, and I don't think you need drones to do that. I don't know if we have time for any other questions. How are we doing? Anybody else? Yes? Uh, yes. Mike Thompson broke rank with the other Democrats and voted in favor of the CISPA Act. I was wondering what your position is on net neutrality. Okay. Um, our website, which I hope you'll visit, um, SolomonForCongress.com. We went dark during the protest against the legislation that was a threat to civil liberties on the web. And we were proud to go dark because net neutrality is a minimum. We can't allow corporations to take over the dominance of a two-tier or five-tier system. We've got to be on a level playing field so that anybody has equal access and equal speed access on the internet. So we've got to protect net neutrality, but that's not enough. We also have to make sure, and I think your question refers to it, that the government doesn't, through the guise of protecting copyright, begin to shut down any website at all. Any website at all. Because you see what happens when you allow a government to begin. Look, I was in Iran, and I would go and try to look at a website like Common Dreams or Truthout, and in Iran, up on the screen it would say, forbidden. Do we want that to happen in our country, that we type into a URL up on the browser and it comes up on the screen forbidden? That should never happen in the United States of America. So I don't know if we have time for, uh, how are we doing? One more. One more. The word is one more. Yes. The question is about single-payer health care. You know, the question has come up with Medicare at age 65. You know, there's some effort from Republicans and even some Democrats. They want to raise the eligibility age up from Medicare. And my answer is, I think we've got to change the eligibility age of Medicare to zero. Everybody has a right to health care. And as somebody who supports very strongly and has for a long time single-payer enhanced Medicare for all, 
I'm very proud that the main sponsor of H.R. 676, federal single-payer health care legislation, Congressman John Conyers, has endorsed me in this race. And let me just say in closing and, and saying uh, thank you very much for the chance to speak with you, that John Conyers has said publicly why he's endorsed me in this race. Because he wants me on the floor of the U.S. House of Representatives at his side fighting for guaranteed enhanced Medicare for all single payer. Let's fight for it and let's get it done. And thanks very much. Thank you.